So this vacation, I was helping my mom out with a bit of spring cleaning. So we were going through all these dusty old papers and dusty old files when I found this treasure trove, this folder just lying in the corner. And when I pulled out this folder and I opened it, lo and behold, I found all the artwork I had made when I was seven or eight years old. So eager to relive those childhood, mo childhood moments, I pulled out all my work and I laid out in front of me. Now, as a child, I never had any formal artistic training. And whatever art I did was completely out of my own imagination. I had this very distinctive style where I used to use stick figures. So if you pay close attention to this drawing, these tiny little squiggles that you see are each stick figures in various poses. So you have stick figures running, you have stick figures jumping, you have paratrooper stick figures, you have stick figures who are US Navy SEALs. And using these stick figures, I used to create the most complex battle scenes. And each of these battle scenes would have an intricately woven backstory. For example, I remember this artwork. I titled it Shark Sea Wars. And it's about a war fought between India and South Korea. For some reason, I don't seem to recall. And it's set in the near future, where soldiers actually travel on rocket-powered surfboards. And there are a lot of sharks in the water, hammerhead sharks, great white sharks, who are eating soldiers from both sides indiscriminately. So I used to create. And I never paid attention to how my drawing looked. I didn't care about how neat this drawing is or what someone would think about this drawing if they saw it. I created for the sake of creating. As I went through all my work, I decided to pull out some of my more recent artwork and just set it side by side and see what is different, what has changed. So I created these two artworks using pen and pencil, and I've paid exquisite detail. I've paid exquisite attention to the details. If you notice carefully, I've paid a lot of attention to the anatomy, making sure this dance pose looks free-flowing and not awkward. I've paid a lot of attention to composition, how these objects in the still life look in relation to each other, the shadows they cast, the different tones, the different textures. But where is that back story? Where is that imagination? I mean, all the skills are in place. My artwork is there. If you look at the composition, it's all there. But where is that imagination? And as I created more work, I got more and more frustrated. And I started tearing up more and more of my artwork because everything looked the same. Every single artwork I made looked the same. Now, as an artist, this was something that really weighed on my mind. And I started looking for answers. Why? Why is this happening to me? Why am I not being able to imagine like I used to as a child? So as a starting point, I try to look at what is imagination. There's an artist, and his name is Brian Lewis Saunders, and he conducted the most fascinating, if what, insane experiment. He drew a self-portrait under the influence of a different drug for a few weeks. And you can see how he perceives and imagines himself to be changes drastically under the influence of a different drug. What he imagines of himself is completely different when he's under the influence of cocaine than when he is under the influence of psilocybin mushrooms. So since what these drugs essentially do is they alter the neuro neurological activity, they alter and affect the chemical reactions that take place in your brain, can we conclude that imagination is nothing but a net product of these biochemical reactions? However, social psychologists believe imagination is much more complex than that. And it is influenced by various contextual and situational factors. Who you're talking to, you, uh, talking to, the environment around you, where you are, it all plays a role in determining your imagination. So there is no real definition of what is imagination that I can present to you today. But there is one truth about imagination, one truth that holds for all of us, and it is this. A child was asked to draw a bird, a child with no formal artistic training, just like me. And he drew it completely out of his own imagination, in a very unconventional style. And then this very same child was asked 
to do an exercise in his maths textbook. This child was asked to color these V-shaped birds. And after he finished coloring these V-shaped birds, the same child was asked to draw a bird. But he didn't draw it as he had the first time. He didn't draw, draw it out of his own imagination, no. He drew the very same V-shape that he just saw. These very same V-shaped birds that I am sure almost all of us have drawn at some point or the other in our lives. But why does this happen? Why does this V-shaped bird, bird phenomenon happen to all of us? It's because of what we call conditioning. Now, as you get older, you see more and more of the world around you and you gain more experiences. So what happens is these experiences start to build up in your mind and you begin to form certain belief systems and preconceptions about the world that are very hard to break as adults. But children are still building these belief systems. They are still gaining these experiences. And as a result, they answer questions based more on emotion, what they feel. And our adult minds are so conditioned that whenever we see something, we always think of how it's been done, how we have seen it in the past. And we study these trends. We study our past experiences and we look at, a way, at, the, at the world in a way that we have seen it in the past. So the situation so far seems pretty bleak. I mean, I can't tell you what is imagination. And this conditioning effect is inevitable. But I felt there was one more thing. As a student, I often hear the phrases, get real, or reality check. We are constantly being told to prioritize rational and logical thinking over just wild and free imagination. A law is held in high esteem, whereas an imaginative conjecture is just not, just not given the same gravity. A person who is imaginative is not viewed as an integral part of our society as the system. An imaginative person is viewed as someone strange, as someone different, who we're not sure how to deal with. And as a result, as we grow older, we get more and more channeled away from imagination. Nothing we can do about it, right? But I start thinking, is there any way of going back, of reverting to how things were when we were children? Is there any way of bringing back that wild spark of imagination, those complex backstories, back into our lives? And I came across this uh, one thing that I remembered immediately, was whenever I traveled by train, and I used to see these electric pylons. Until I was around nine years old, I never thought of them as electric pylons. When I saw these structures, I used to call them rockets. I used to tell my mom, look, there are rockets outside. And I used to pretend like we were passing through this NASA launch pad. This is something we all do as children. We see the same things that everyone else sees, but we give it our own meaning. We've all played with Lego. We've all played at house. We create our own world. But as we get older, there are rules that come into play. And these rules begin to rule us. And I'm not talking of just rules and laws as in judiciary rules. I'm talking about rules in ethics, morality. What is acceptable? What is unacceptable? What is good art? And these rules begin to influence our thinking more. And as a result, we get less imaginative. So I feel if we want to reintroduce that wild childhood imagination, one thing we can do is start to build our own world again. So start with the simple things. The next time you're traveling by car and you see people walking on the road, don't just see any random people walking on the road. No. Give them your own identity. Ask yourself, who is this person? Where is he going? Where is he from? Is he from this planet? See the same things that everyone else sees, but start to weave your own world around it. Give it your own meaning. I feel if we revert to how we were as children and start creating our own world again, that imagination is just going to come back. Now, as a child, I used to read a lot of comics, and I do a lot of comic art as well. And comics has remained a passion for me till date. And my favorite comic, undoubtedly, is Calvin and Hobbes. And there's this part in Calvin and Hobbes where Calvin pretends he is this character called Spaceman Spiff. And when he's Spaceman Spiff, he doesn't see the world the same way. He doesn't see his teacher as a teacher. He sees her as this green monster. And he keeps blasting her with these laser guns. 
So when Calvin is spaceman spiff, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we should pretend our teachers are green monsters. When Calvin was spaceman spiff, he saw the world in a completely different way. I start thinking, is there more to this? Is there some sort of scientific backing to what is happening in Calvin and Hobbes? And I came across this research done by the University of Indiana, where these professors devised a series of questions that require highly imaginative and divergent thinking to solve. And they posed these same questions to three groups. One group was told that these questions were framed in California, 2,000 miles away. One group was told that these questions were framed in Indiana, which is just two miles away. And one group was told that these questions were just framed. Well, they were a control group. And these were the same questions that were asked to students of relatively the same backgrounds, the same skill sets, the same ability, the same level of imagination per se. So just telling them where these questions were made shouldn't really affect anything, right? Wrong. Because the students who were told that these questions were framed in California were able to think more imaginatively. It's because of spatial distance. It's not fully understood how or why. But when you look at the world, when you look at a problem from a distance, when you look at it from the perspective of someone else, when Calvin looked at the world from the perspective of Spaceman Spiff, when he created the spatial distance, we get more imaginative. So I looked a lot at my past and my childhood, and I decided to move a little more back into the present. And one incident came to my mind in English literature class. English literature class is one of my favorite classes where we just analyze poems and we go into the dark realm of themes, ideas, motifs, the emotions of the poet, what is behind these lines, the subtext. And discussion in class one day was going in all these wild tangents and discussion was getting very abstract when my friend raised his hand and asked a very simple question that remains with me till date. My friend raised his hand and asked me, and asked my teacher, sorry. He asked my teacher, what is the point? Which made me think, before we do anything, why do we always ask ourselves, what is the point? We are conditioned into thinking of outcomes. If something doesn't have a tangible goal, we are not as willing to do it. We think in terms of pros, cons, efficiency. I see my economics teacher sitting in the audience. We think in terms of opportunity costs. It's conditioning. It all affects us, and we constantly think in terms of outcomes. But children, children don't just have goals. No, children have dreams. When I was seven or eight, I didn't do my art so that people would look at it and say, wow, that's beautiful. That moved me. That touched me. When I wrote a book in the fourth grade, I didn't write it so that I would generate revenues. I didn't write a book in the fourth grade so that people would look at it and say, that's pretty impressive though it was pretty impressive. <laughs> I created for the sake of creating. I created because I could. I created because I wanted to. And this is something that all children do. So if we move this whole th thought process of thinking in terms of results, outcomes, if we move it to the side, entire tangents, entire, entire pathways of thoughts open up to us, which may not lead to the most tangible goals, but they lead to very special places where the best ideas come from. So I've spoken a lot about imagination and how it goes away, maybe what it is, and how we can bring it back into our lives. But I can already hear my friend in English literature class raising his hand and asking me, what is the point? I'm not an artist. I'm not a designer. Why do I need imagination in my life? What if I do an administrative job? I sit at a desk, I sort papers out, I file papers, I look at documents, I sort, I do all this logistical work. Why do I need imagination? The answer to that question lies in the answer to this question, which I will give you 10 seconds to solve. Okay, time up. Did anyone get it? Undoubtedly, the first thing you thought when you saw these questions is, they're numbers. So what mathematical formulae can I apply? 
Do I need to add these digits? Do I need to multiply them, subtract them, divide them, apply some mathematical process and arrive at some outcome? No. The answer to this question is two. All you have to do is count the number of circular figures in each number. For example, an eight is made of two circles. So eight, eight, zero, nine has six circles. That's it. That's as simple as it gets. A KG kid would be able to solve this in two minutes. All you people with your formal training, your degrees, were lost. <laughs> this is the power of imagination. It helps you beat conditioning. It helps you beat that entire thought process of thinking in terms of outcomes. This is the power of imagination. Because logic and rationality can get you from A to B. But imagination, imagination can take you everywhere. Thank you.